And then threads in different warps can take different code paths, and that causes no performance degradation. So I have a question here. Okay. So this is one thing that uh, I just wanted to, oh, it, that I wanted to clarify, um, and I haven't had an opportunity to ask in the past. So basically, if, if you have a whole bunch of conditions and that causes your, your uh, threads within your warp to diverge, then if you have a sync thread, does that bring them all back into lockstep? Does that re-merge the... So um, I'm assuming since you're on a microphone, I don't have to repeat the questions? Correct. Okay. All right. So, uh, so yes and no. <laughs> Let me restate your question so I can answer it clearly. <laughs> if, if you had all of your threads diverge, but they actually, in, you know, it's an if-then-else, but you've gotten to the bottom of it, and they're all, uh, they all are on the same path, but maybe not aligned, yeah. if you have a sync threads, that will bring them all into alignment, and then they will go forward okay. on their own. Yes. Okay. But I mean, if you had them on, if it, if it was an if-then-else, and you had sync threads in the middle of the if-then-else, you would hang forever. Okay. Okay. And the hardware is actually pretty good at, at finding the alignment again. Uh, the, the combination of the compiler and the, the hardware execution, the, the compiler and, and uh, uh, just-in-time uh, interpreter will lay out the code so that barring any really bizarre events happening with memory traffic, They'll exit the if then else on adjacent cycles and recombine, and the hardware looks looks for that. So so it should work anyway. But there's uh, there's no harm, no foul in too many sync threads. It's really good uh, to to think of your code as as uh, synchronizing very regularly. It's a it's a really good idea. Okay. Any other questions, locally or remotely? All right. So uh, registers and, and warp scheduling. Uh, there's a lot of state that's associated with each thread and each block of threads, uh, including the registers and uh, local, uh, local shared memory, local memory, and, uh, and data that's in, in the uh, L1 cache. And uh, I didn't actually make this slide, so I'm going to say this next sentence is a little funny in the way it's stated. There's no overhead to store and restore state when switching threads. It's totally free. There's no overhead. How is that possible? Because we don't store and restore. It's all resident. It doesn't ever, once a, a block of threads has been launched, and its space has been allocated in the register file and, and thread space and uh, all the rest on the, on the multiprocessor, it, it does not leave until it reaches the end and it's finished executing. So there's, there's, no, um, there's no context switching in the, in the CPU kind of sense. We don't store and, and restore state. We just simply choose a different block or a different warp to execute from. It's all resident. It all stays there. Uh, that's good and bad. One of the, the other things to, to think about is that uh, we can have uh, a lot of threads running on each multiprocessor, and there's a lot of multiprocessors on the machine at a given time. So whenever you think about some resource that your, your thread is using, get in the habit of multiplying that by 30,000 or so. Because that's how many instances of it there are when the machine is fully populated with threads and blocks in, in all the SMs. So, you know, people ask us, you know, well, why can't I have a thousand registers? Well, because that would be 30 million registers. It's too many. Uh, you you ha have to just kind of get in the habit of thinking of, of large numbers. Practice visualizing large numbers when you, when you look at, at what you're doing in your thread. Uh, and the reason we do that is to, to hide all the uh, uncontrolled latency that happens in, in the compute pipeline in the machine. The uh, instruction latency and, more importantly, the memory latency to the external DRAM is all hidden by 
our ability to switch threads with, with zero overhead. So uh, on, the, on a CPU, on a, on a microprocessor, the whole architecture is built expecting that you will get a cache hit when you try and access a piece of data or you try and run an instruction. The whole pipeline is optimized so that when you want to run the next instruction with its data, it's there. It's, it's in the cache or in registers, but only a few cycles away. It's not all the way you know, across the campus on the, on the DRAM. Uh, in contrast, the way the entire GPU pipeline is architected is it's built for cache miss. We build a multiprocessor which has the ability to switch between many, many threads which might be ready to run so that we have the ability to do something useful while we wait the hundreds of cycles it may take for the, the data to get from, from the DRAM to the shared memory or the, the registers or wherever we're gonna, gonna run it. So uh, this is kind of like hyper-threading, but to the end, to the extreme. There's, there's a bazillion threads running at any given time. And there's many, many threads running concurrently in various stages of execution in the multiprocessor. There's this whole seething mass of threads, always parts of them are, are happening. And the, it's all scheduled at runtime. There's no static scheduling uh, in advance. And it's, it's done at warp granularity. There's uh, warps of individual instructions from each block are, are consumed per cycle. And uh, you can run independent instructions. Oh, I have a question. So uh, you're saying that uh, even though there is an L1 cache on the SM, there won't be any cache miss effect like we see in the CPUs. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, I will talk more about the L1 cache uh, in a couple of slides. But um, with, with the CPU, uh, with, with a, a standard microprocessor, if you just look at the die of the microprocessor, it's mostly cache, and there's a little bit of execution unit in the corner. And if you look at a GPU, it's mostly execution unit, and there's a little bit of cache. Now, add to that the fact that we have uh, all of these, these different threads, you know, 30,000 threads. You can do the math for yourself, but there's less than a single cache line per thread. Uh, in fact, far less. There may be less than a, a cache line per uh, warp. <laughs> so. If you think of this like a CPU cache, you're, first you're going to get fused and confused. Second, you're going to hurt yourself because there, there is no long-term reuse with the L1 cache in the same way there is on the CPU. The L1 cache is, is pretty much a mechanism for broadcasting to all the threads. If, if uh, different threads are are using similar or nearby data in the same cycle or within a few cycles of each other, then you get efficient reuse. But 10 or 20 cycles later, the L1 cache is completely burned. It doesn't have anything in it that it had in it before. Because there's so many threads touching the cache and potentially doing different things. So it, it's, uh, there's a lot of debate internally about whether we should call this a cache or not because it, it leads people to, to make assumptions uh, based on what they know about caches on other kinds of processors. Did, did I answer your question? I have, Thanks. Okay. I have a question from someone online that emailed me. Uh, what is, on average, the global memory latency in Fermi or older hardware relative to the system clock? and? Also, same question for the shared memory. OK. So I'm going to give you order of magnitude answers, because I don't know the exact numbers. But uh, the, the, the latency from the DRAM, so if you try and fetch a value from DRAM and you need it right away, uh, is on the order of hundreds of cycles, at least 200. And depending on what else is going on, how, how deep in the, uh, in the queue waiting for your data you are, if there's a bunch of other transactions outstanding, it can be many hundreds to thousands of cycles. So uh, if, 
I think you've had examples uh, earlier in the week of of, uh, of badly written algorithms like uh, a naive uh, matrix multiply implementation, which always goes to external memory. In that example, you're probably waiting a thousand cycles for every every data byte, um, and this is not going to get better. DRAMs are are basically getting slower, not faster, compared to processor clocks. Uh, the other uh, part of the question about latency of, of shared memory, it's on the order of a few cycles, somewhere between 1 and 10, which for our purposes are, are the same. 10 cycles is free for, uh, for this kind of machine because there's so many other things you can be doing. You can always find something to do for 10 cycles. It's harder to find something to do for hundreds of cycles. But it's possible, too. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that at, at the end of this, this talk. Okay, more questions at this point? Okay, so, um, so the hardware chooses which instructions, uh, which warp of instructions to, to schedule and to run, and it may run instructions from the same thread, uh, or it may run instructions from another warp or another block, uh, just whatever is ready. And the hardware manages the scoreboarding to make sure that operands and data are ready and just can run anything that, that has all of its, its parts available to run. And uh, nobody asked the question. Usually somebody asked the question here and said, you know, so can I count on the fact that you'll run in the same warp or that you'll do round robin and everything will stay balanced? No. From your point of view, it's totally random. And that strategy actually has changed between different hardware generations uh, to try and make it more efficient. Uh, but it's not part of the programming model. So uh, memory access uh, to the physical DRAM. Uh, the memory accesses are issued per warp. And think of it as a, a vector of addresses. So this is really like, like a data vector. Um, and this is in keeping with the whole idea that a, a multiprocessor is running a group of threads. It's not running, it's not doing any single thread stuff. So it's doing all the work for 32 threads. And uh, there's uh, a big crossbar bus that sits between the different banks of multiprocessors and the uh, DRAM system. And on this bus, there's no like single byte or 32 bit word. Um, transactions, um, all the bus transactions are contiguous aligned memory regions. Um, and the smallest transaction size we, we support is 32 bytes. That would, that would, by the way, be a byte access for each of 32 threads if they were aligned. So that would, that's the smallest. If, you, if you're thinking in this multiprocessor way of thinking, that's, that's how that, how that is explained and 128 bytes, which is uh, excuse me, um, which is 32-bit word uh, for each of the threads. Um, so the throughput, if you think about, if that's the only way the, the 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 water goes through the pipe, you know, you need to make your accesses look like that. So the maximum throughput is when a warp addresses and utilizes entire regions that are contiguous uh, and aligned. And you certainly can access any inefficient or foolish addressing pattern you want. Uh, and you'll be punished for it with low performance. Uh, we will handle any arbitrary addressing pattern. Uh, but there may be uh, performance degradation because we have to mask and merge the data that you requested. Uh, and also, if if your memory transaction request is going to physical memory and you've, you've uh, requested 32 different physical DRAM locations that aren't near each other, the hardware will have to read from the DRAM 32 times to, to get that, that data. And if they're far apart in the DRAM, that'll take a really long time. 